can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, some of the founders you've heard of, some you've you know never heard of. Actually, Chris, some, some of the past interviews I've loved, and I know you like to hear some of those struggle stories as well. Um, I had um, P90X founder Tony Horton on. You know, he sold obviously hundreds of millions of P90X, but he was uh, made money, food and rent money, as a street mime. So he, when he drove out originally, to make his food and, and rent money, he put his hat on the street and he did street miming. And that's actually how he started making uh, some money. Uh, and then Julie Clark, founder of um, Baby Einstein, she talks about growing her company to $20 million with five employees and selling to Disney, but she talks about beating cancer twice and her journey as far as that goes. So you can check out that many more on inspiredinsider.com. Um, this episode uh, is brought to you by Rise25 which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran, and we help B2B businesses connect to their Dream 100 partnerships and clients by running their podcast. So it generates ROI. And um, it's been the number one thing. You know, Chris, for me, relationships are the number one thing in my life. And hence your t-shirt, the (laughs) anti-anti-social. Like I actually like being around people. I love building relationships and helping others and, and giving. And the podcast allows me to have a platform to give to my best relationships and the people in my universe. So I always love when my friends have podcasts, even though now it's self-serving because we have a service that does that. But even before that, it makes it very easy for people, me to introduce them to other people and have them on their platform. So you can check out rise25.com. And um, there's a video of John and I bantering like an old married couple and how you get ROI with a podcast. But um, I'm excited for today's guest. You know, he's got a couple different amazing things going on. If one wasn't enough, I have Chris Nealon. He is the CEO of Cult Collective. I love the name, you know. Uh, one of the North America's premier engagement marketing firms. So what they do is they help companies embrace proven marketing principles that he's discovered while working with the most iconic cult-like brands on the planet. So he's worked with companies like John Deere, Home Depot. He co-founded Cult in 2010 and has consulted with Harley Davidson, Canadian Tire, Zappos, Best Buy, Keurig. I mean, all those, Chris, are cult-like. Like, you know when you get people to get a tattoo, you're cult-like, right? Yeah. Like Harley Davidson. I mean, Zappos is a cult-like following too. Um, also, you could check out his book. He's co-author of Fix, Break the Addictions. Um, and he co-founded Communo, which is an agency talent management platform which is exploding in any crisis environment or non-crisis environment, I guess you could say. They help small agencies exploit the sharing economy. Chris, thanks for joining me. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, Jeremy, for taking a few minutes with me. You know, there's so many things I wanted to dive deep on. And um, besides the, I don't know if you have a love for magic, but I see the stuff behind you. Um, But (laughs) but I do. My my wife doesn't let me keep any of my magic stuff in the house. So I've had to Move are you all to my office? Are you a amateurish or professional magician, or what? I am. A, I am an amateur magician. I kill at eight-year-old birthday parties. <laughs> uh, I, I force my employees to put up with a magic show once a year at our holiday end of year party, uh, and I, I love. Uh, I love the idea of being fooled. I like to be bamboozled. Actually, I, I hate it, but I hate it enough that I enjoy the process of trying to figure out what the hell just happened. I'm a huge, huge fan of like the street man, you know, the David Blaine's of the world and, and the yeah. mentalist magician. So um, uh, I don't know if you'll do a trick on, on camera if people are watching it. <laughs> it's but, a um, podcast. It's, well, uh, there's a video, video, it's too? video too. Yeah, it's um, video too. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to get into, so you may, you, you have to stay to the end because he may or may not do a magic trick for us. But um. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll make these peanut M&Ms disappear. <laughs> That's too easy. I know that one. <laughs> um, the cult scorecard. You yeah. know, I find that fascinating. Um, what are some things that go into the cult scorecard? And I know you have like a set of kind of cult philosophies, values. So we created the cult brand scorecard to help people um, self-assess the cult worthiness or the cult capabilities 
of their company. Because I think one of the things that disappoints us is how many people write their category off. Like if they worked for Converse or Rolex or the New York Yankees, they say, I get it. People care about that. But I work at a gas station brand or I work at a grocery brand or I work at a toilet paper brand. It's not as sexy. People just don't care. And there are, there are absolutely categories that people don't care about. The more utilitarian and commoditized things like gasoline or electricity are very hard uh, to create hyper levels of engagement. But I, the point of the scorecard is to open people's minds that more often than not, you have written off your company or your category uh, and you've neutered yourself from the potential that you actually have because you're using excuses because maybe others in your space haven't achieved irrational levels of adoration. Therefore, you think that customers don't want to provide irrational levels of adoration. I always like to use the example of Wawa. Are you familiar with Wawa? No. Wawa is um, the most popular convenience store in Pennsylvania, uh, they, but they're throughout the, the continental Northeast. Um, but they have something like 250 stores just in Pennsylvania, and they're always voted the best cup of coffee, the best hoagie sandwich, the best place to fill up a Sign gas. me up. And it's like, guys, this is just a gas station. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> it's not that the product was exceptional. It's that they decided to make the experience exceptional. Um, so I like the scorecards. I try to encourage people. The way that we ask questions has more to do with their courage than their category. It has more to do with their creativity than their industry. And it is designed to hopefully open some eyes and say, you know, why? Why wouldn't we want to not only be financially successful, but wildly significant and culturally relevant? And uh, it's just, it's really rewarding to work with an occult brand. So I'm disappointed that more people aren't uh, sort of aiming for the stars to become it. Chris, with the Wawa situation, um, what is something that they do that help, you know, what, what's an experience? With them. Well, I think a big part of it is, is yeah. they redefine what business they're in, right? I mean, Wawa is not in the business of getting people gas. Wawa is in the business of being the most, um, uh, at the hub of a community. They want, to be the, they want to be a reason for people to come and start their day with Wawa. They allow high school kids to loiter in the parking lot after school to become a hangout where people are buying, you know, candy bars legally or, or vapes illegally, you know, um, they want to become culturally relevant. Um, they give back to the community. One of the fascinating things about Wawa is it's largely uh, employee owned. So the person making that hoagie or the person filling your gas is most likely a millionaire yeah. because of the stock equity programs that they have. And so their, their internal engagement is off the charts. Hmm. Um, so they just had a commitment to, we want to become meaningful. So therefore we're going to do different things. Hmm. Yeah, so people really there also just take ownership over it because they all are owners, I guess you could say. Yeah, I mean, a big, there's a huge correlation between companies that are voted best places to work and external uh, adoration or advocacy. So you look at even something like a Chobani or a Google. Um, you know, these places invest heavily in their employees. And there's just this halo effect. There's this spillover effect of if you're doing right by your employees, um, certain enlightened customers start to give you more grace. The media starts to give, you know, report on you in a better light. And, um, you know, we've seen it work in reverse as well when brands can be exposed. Uh, I remember when Nike, which is an amazing cult brand, had to kind of come, come to Jesus moment with their um, manufacturing practices in Vietnam and the sweatshop conditions. And, you know, I love that about the transparency of brands today is there's really no place to hide. You know, Amazon is loved for its convenience and hated for its uh, unethical treatment of warehouse workers. And, they, and, and they, they hold Jeff Bezos accountable to that. And they, they're expecting the company to fix that. And in his last uh, shareholders report, Bezos said, hey, we're putting profits back into hazard pay for people that are working throughout Corona and uh, health insurance and making sure that we're a bit more equitable employer. So uh, it, it's, it's a big cocktail that kind of goes into that level of cult of accomplishment. Because early on in your career, um, you know, you work with companies like John Deere and Home Depot. What, what's something you learned from John Deere? Well, so John Deere was, I, I graduated from Northwestern in 99. Um, 
I'm not name dropping or bragging. You mentioned something about Northwestern, so I was reminding you. Although it wasn't fabulous. The Wildcats. Um, so did you move uh, to Peoria? Peoria is John Deere lo- uh, based in Peoria. Or is- well, John Deere has three divisions: agricultural, which is in Peoria; uh, residential, which is in Raleigh, North Carolina; and uh, construction, which I think is in Moline, Illinois, if I remember correctly. I, I worked for the residential thing, so anything a homeowner would buy. Is weed whackers, riding lawn mowers, generators, stuff like that. But the reason why I took that job is I was graduate. I, I, I wanted to work for the most iconic brand. I've always been kind of fascinated for what is it that makes some brands more exceptional than others. Um, and I, as, a, as a fan of marketing, I was, you know, I, I was curious. Was it their storytelling? Was it their origin story? Was it their promotional strategies or activations, what was it? And um, in, in, in 99, if you can appreciate December of 99, um, all the lists were coming out of, you know, of the past century. So the best of this, the were your best bands, the best you know, restaurants, the best uh, movies. And one of them was the, the, the top 10 most powerful brands mm. of, of the 1900s. And uh, Coca-Cola was number one. Mercedes was on the list, but John Deere was on the list. And uh, John Deere was sort of recruiting. And I said, I, I, I considered it a second MBA to just go, let me go walk those halls and learn what John Deere does. And you know what? It exceeded all my expectations. The huh. number of, of fan mail that we would get of kid birthday parties with John Deere cakes and kid bedrooms with John Deere wallpaper and John Deere bedspreads and kid clothes and toys. I mean, they, they sell a billion dollars in die cast toys and shovels and it's just a phenomenal uh brand but its origins go all the way back to the 1800s there's very few brands that are that relevant for over a century but i mean it was a remarkable product and then uh, they did a lot of good things during the great depression which i actually think is very relevant for today how businesses um how businesses deal with recession and how businesses display empathy when their customers are unemployed um, I think uh, that John Deere did a lot of things that sort of saved the American farm back in the 30s that now, you know, two or three generations of farmers later, they don't forget that John Deere let us keep the equipment when we couldn't pay for it kind of mm. thing. And uh, that, that plays into their sort of Americana heritage. When you were, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. I mean, I didn't even think of that, right? During that time. Yeah. And it's totally relevant today. Um, what did you see walking the halls in, in, you know, doing work with them, what did you see when you said you exceed your expectations? What was like a story from that? The number one thing I saw was that, I mean, people talk about Harley Davidson a lot about tattooing on your body. I would argue there's as many, if not more John Deere tattoos, hats. Uh, You know, we did a fun thing at the time. Uh, George Clooney was doing a movie and they asked John Deere to donate a bunch of equipment. And at the end of the day, we opted out of it, but we gave them two dozen hats as thank you for considering us. And George Clooney grabbed the John Deere hat and wore it as his character throughout uh, the whole movie, The Perfect Storm. So it was like free product placement. Yeah. You know, we didn't give them the hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment they asked for, but we gave them a $20 hat that was in the movie for 80% of the show. Um, but I also think there was a tremendous amount of respect. I think the people that managed the John Deere brand knew that they were stewards of something very special. So there wasn't a lot of this ego that this is something that I built, I made, um, we're gonna do it my way, but rather, um, you know, if anything, they were a bit too conservative because there was a, we can't screw this up sort of uh, mentality. Um, it was also fascinating that when I was at John Deere for 120 years, they had sold through private dealers. And um, on my watch, they, um, <clears throat> they decided to sell through mass merchants, so Home Depot. And um, that was a gigantic thing. You know, Home Depot in one year wrote a check worthy of every riding lawnmower that they'd ever sold through a dealer network the past year. So, I mean, John Deere, or, you know, Home Depot and John Deere kind of created this a new marriage, and that was a new sort of uh, way of bringing that brand to the mass market as opposed to being a bit more elitist and luxury uh, before that. So, I, I wasn't there for very long, just under three years. Um, because I ended up actually going to Home Depot through that relationship. Uh, I was exposed to, at the time, my department at John Deere was spending maybe uh, 50 to 60 million and Home Depot was spending 
900 million. I mean, it was almost like a billion dollars. So Home Depot was building two stores a day and was becoming the darling of big box retail. So it was another great opportunity to get another education at taking a brand and making it, you know, scale. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, and I was looking, uh, Chris, on your site, I, I encourage anyone to go to cultideas.com. But part of the philosophy is eight points to become a cult brand, right? And so there's be remarkable, have a purpose, you know, and there's a bunch of others. You can check it out. One I thought was interesting was pick a fight. So I thought yeah. you would maybe expand on that a little bit. Well, that, you, you picked the most provocative and controversial of the eight. Um, when we are consulting with clients and sort of either grading them or helping them improve their quote unquote score in one of those eight principles, we will always caveat pick a fight as this is a masterclass. This is the darker arts of cult branding. It is not for everyone, particularly our Canadian clients are way too nice to want to really do this. <laughs> it, yeah. It's two things. It leans into many challenger brand principles. So, Challenger brands are almost always more fun to work with. And Burger King was just voted marketer of the decade for 2010, 2020. And just think about the freedom they have when, when they know they're number two and everybody knows who number one is. You just get to do more irreverent things. Pepsi does more irreverent stuff than Coke. Mac did more irreverent stuff than Microsoft. Burger King does crazier stuff than, than McDonald's. And so there's a lot of creativity a lot of fun, but then you also lean into that, that, that political side of stuff where it gets into mudslinging and where it gets into, um, I may not be great, but at least I'm not as bad as this guy or that gal uh, kind of thing. So there, between those two extremes, there is some uh, principles uh, that can be deploy, uh, 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 applied by not just um, defining what you're fighting for, but defining what you're fighting against. I mean, a great example here is on my desk. This is a Swell water bottle, right? I mean, Swell, this is a $50 art piece that I feel better about myself walking around. It's a badge. I can get the same thing for 20 bucks at Walmart that's not Swell branded. But Swell's villain isn't a competitor. Swell's villain is the plastic water bottle. And when you hear their CEO talk, she's not just talking about the sales performance of the Swell business. She's talking about the elimination of the plastic bottle footprint and the good that they're doing in the planet. Patagonia would be the same way. Ben and Jerry's would be the same way. And it doesn't always have to be save the planet. Southwest Airlines was fighting against, you know, they wanted to democratize the skies. They called their gate agents freedom fighters. They were fighting against the family station wagon road trip. They thought it was egregious that you'd take two of your five vacation days just on driving to grandma's Christmas house. vacation. All yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, their, their villain, if you will, was um, we wanted to make it affordable for a family of five to fly and enjoy the privilege of air travel. This is again in the 70s, right, when they started. But um, it's a very powerful way to galvanize because it's not just people that like you, but it's also people who also hate the thing that you're fighting against. So it creates a heightened level of emotional attachment. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, because any good story, book, movie, yeah. if it doesn't have a villain... Well, what, what, you know, well, it, um, it's funny you say that. So a few years ago, we honored Marvel at the gathering. The gathering is this annual event that we do for, uh, to kind of celebrate and learn from the most cult like brands on the planet. Um, Marvel was, was awarded. And I think some people today kind of roll their eyes thinking, well, Marvel's it, choosing them is cheating. They, they're too good. And it's like, I, they forget Marvel went bankrupt in the late nineties. Marvel is only a 20-year-old success story tied to remarkable creativity and courage to do something nobody had ever done before, which is to create that Marvel universe of 22 films that are all interconnected. And it was the, they're reaping the benefits of that courage. And it's not, yeah, everyone they launch now makes you know, $500 million, but it wasn't always that way. And when I was talking to the woman from Marvel, I said, why does Marvel, why does it seem like Marvel can't get it wrong? and DC can't get it right. Like is Superman that much less popular than, than you know, Spider-Man or is Iron Man that much less popular than Batman? She was actually, from a character perspective, Batman and Superman have more brand equity. They sell more comic books, they sell more pajamas, they sell more uh, you know, TV shows. But what Marvel does is they tell better stories of the villains. They make the bad guys 
more reasonable. And, and that Disney does the same thing. There is no Lion King without Scar. There is no Little Mermaid without Ursula. And the, the villains get a disproportionate amount of airtime. You figure the last big Endgame thing, that was a Thanos movie. It was a movie about the bad guy, not even the good guys destroying him. And so, yeah, they really understand that if you don't, unless you properly position the villain, the defeat of that villain is not as engaging. Yeah. I mean, because one of my favorite books uh, on, on this, uh, actually, I mean, there's so many good ones, but uh, Ben Settle wrote Persuasion Secrets of the World's Most Charismatic and Influential Villains. And it's a very short read. Most people have not heard of it, but it's, it's fantastic. And he talks about this in it. Um, what's your favorite example from the companies you've consulted with and helped um, the pick a fight story that they actually applied what you said and um, actually executed on it? Well, I, I think one of my favorites, I don't know if it's my favorite. It's my favorite for, for a couple of reasons. One, it just did a lot of good for an underrepresented group, but it was mm -hmm. also uh, it's from Zappos and there's a group within Zappos called Zappos Adaptive. Um, I marvel at Zappos. I don't know how Zappos is a multi-billion dollar success story. They don't make anything that they sell. Everything they sell, you can buy someplace else by actually trying it on. Uh, they're a premium price point. They never go on discount. They don't mass advertise. It's like, how is Zappos a thing? Right? Because they, they, in any one of those areas, they're bested by somebody else. And yet people love Zappos. Um, but Zappos asked us to help them do a project called Adaptive, which is basically Zappos for special needs situations, um, di certain disabilities, amputees, different handicaps. So one of the big things that they actually just announced a couple of weeks ago is they'll sell single shoes. Um, so people that maybe only have one leg or people that have different size feet. You know, you're always basically having to buy a pair and throw one out. Right. Um, and they do other things like shoes that don't have to be laced up, et cetera, et cetera. But essentially the villain in that case was the mainstream. And because it's efficient and because it's status quo, nobody ever stops to think about the 2% or the 5% that can't button a shirt because they don't have use of their fingers. Right. And so it was, it was a really good sort of feel good moment to say, you know, these privileged people who have full use of all their limbs um, never pause to think about how difficult it is to get dressed every day if you don't. And uh, Zappos Adaptus is now going to give a voice and give a platform and more mm -hmm. importantly, give products that provide real solutions uh, for that audience. And so that was a bit of a tearjerker kind of a thing where you realize that there were people who for 30 years have had to suffer in silence because they didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to be the difficult one and ask somebody to, can you make that a zipper instead of a, you know, a lace because I don't know how to tie. I love it. Yeah. Um, so they're serving the underserved, I guess yes. you could say. Mm -hmm. Love that. Um, Chris, on the, the cult ideas front, um, I would love for you to talk about, you mentioned Harley Davidson. There's a bunch of um, really interesting case studies um, you talk about. Um, I'd love for you to talk about Harley Davidson a little bit. So Harley was our, when we, we used to be a more traditional advertising agency and in 2012, we sort of said no more of this. And, and what we were saying no more to was no more solving real problems with superficial window dressing. We were tired of clients asking us for ad campaigns to create relevance for their category when what they really needed was a better product, a better price point, or a better customer experience. And we were inspired in 2009, 2010, which to this day I still herald one of the best uh, ad campaigns of all time, which was the Domino's Pizza Turnaround campaign. If you maybe remember a decade ago, their CEO came on TV saying, hey, our pizza sucks. Uh, the focus groups say that it tastes like cardboard, they'd rather put ketchup on the box than eat our sauce and this kind of stuff. And it was jarring, it was shocking that there was so much honesty but the, you know, the backstory was their sales were tanking, their franchisees were revolting. They threw a Hail Mary to their ad agency. They hired the hottest ad shop in the country at the time, Crispin Porter, and said, save us. And Crispin Porter gave them half of the money back and said, I'm not going to like go buy Super Bowl commercials and start screaming dominoes and, and carpet bombing the world with coupons. Go make a better product. Mm. And it was, it was very, it had a lot of integrity for Chris and Porter. They could have made a lot more money if they just created some funny commercials, 
uh, but they, they did real marketing. And I think that that's the lost art today. I think too many brands advertise, not enough brands market. And so that's a long backstory to say. We decided that going forward, Colt was going to be a marketing business, not in the advertising business. And um, Harley Davidson was the first brand that called us. And I think they were one part attracted to our name. <laughs> uh, Harley likes being the rebel and the outlaw and, and having a business called Colt was provocative. And they were one part attracted to our point of view. Uh, at the time, Harley was spending 85% of their discretionary ad dollars on existing customers. Think about that. I mean, that is an unbelievable statistic. Most brands, 90% of brands, spend 85% of their discussion dollars on acquisition, trying to get new customers. I mean, that story alone, I like to say, if, if, you, if you agree that Harley has a cult-like following and you want to achieve the benefits that Harley has, has uh, achieved, then just simply do what they do and redeploy your dollars away from acquisition into what I call advocacy. We like to say, stop making ads and start creating advocates. And Harley realized that nobody's better at selling bikes than their existing fans who get their buddies to also buy a bike so they can go riding together on a Saturday. Harley makes a ridiculous amount of money on upgrades. They make a ridiculous amount of money on clothing and apparel. There's a lifestyle around that brand that they can monetize. Their, their Harley owners group is one of the largest and best run loyalty programs. It's not points-based. It's not, they don't fall into the same pitfalls that, that people like JC Penney's or Best Buy do trying to fake loyalty, you know, hotels and airlines, et cetera. It's legitimate loyalty. So they called us and it was an interesting challenge because it was um, Harley for generations had been the bike that you graduate into. So you get started on a little CC Honda and then maybe upgrade to a Yamaha, but you always sort of pine for when I get to that midlife crisis, I'm going to get me that Harley Cruiser. <laughs> and they dominated that marketplace, but they didn't want to wait for their audiences to get to be 50 to, to, so they wanted to get into a more of an entry-level bike. And just like that Domino's Pizza example, we talked about, well, you can't, you can't just start on a $26,000 cruiser. You need a lower price point bicycle. You need a different spec and featured bike. So they came out with this thing called Dark Custom, which was much more entry-level, much more street and urban and millennial-centric. Um, and so we had to try to make it so that Harley was, could be your first bike, not your last. And then they also paid us to help get – uh, underrepresented groups, particularly women, uh, to become riders because Harley had a very masculine, uh, you know, uh, I think a lot of women were intimidated to even walk into the dealership, uh, as well as minorities because Harley has a very Western culture, easy rider sort of uh, image. And Asian countries and European countries didn't grow up with that same lore and legend. And so we had to create new stories and new reasons to you know, take part of that American dream, if you will. So it was, a, it was a great, we worked with them for three years and uh, really, I, I think that Harley is legitimate. They have earned, now they're having some trouble uh, now. Um, they, they've always, I think, sort of struggled with the balance of manufacturing and the high cost of manufacturing and uh, doing things here in the States and uh, versus lots of things that have been offshore. But um, I, I, they, they, there's no doubt they will go down in history as one of the greatest brands of all. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that. That's interesting. Um, it's when you have a company like that come to you, um, it's, I guess, I don't know if it's humbling, but it's like, wow, they're already super successful. And they, in those are the type of companies that want to be even more successful. Well, it's terrifying. I mean, Zappos was the same way. I mean, I, we, we talk about Zappos in our book. We've put Zappos on a pedestal. We've honored them at the gathering as one of the top cult brands. And, and then when they ask you to work with them, you have to kind of check yourself and say, you know, are we good enough to add any value here? Uh, I would feel that way if Nike called. I'd feel that way if Apple called, Starbucks, et cetera. But um, the reality is, is that we're all just people. Um, the reality is nobody gets to rest on their laurels. I think of Chipotle. Chipotle was one of my favorite cult brands. Uh, they did so many things right until they didn't. And once people start you know, dying of E. coli, not once, not twice, but three different times over their remediation process, you realize, oh, there's still work to do to win back those that we lost, to, to, to maintain and to keep our, our cult status. I and mean, there's no shortage of brands that were really hot for a decade, it's can you be relevant for decades? I, we're looking at Yeti right now. Yeti is one of our favorite cult brands. And, um, 
you know, they've had an amazing run, Airbnb as well, an amazing run, but they're both 10 years old. So it's like, can, are they going to be just as relevant and just as attractive 20, 30, 40 years from now? I, I think so. I know some of the leadership in both those companies and they're amazing individuals who are doing the right things for the right reasons, but you can't get lazy. You can't rest on your laurels. And oftentimes what happens is those amazing leaders exit, right? They get their payday, they go. And the next group of people that come in don't have the same emotional attachment to the brand that the founders did and brands start to get worse as they kind of go from CEO to CEO. Chris, I'd love to hear, you know, you mentioned, you know, we know the Harley Davidson's of the world, the Zappos of the world, the Airbnb. I'm wondering who do you see as some of the up and coming cult brands? Maybe, maybe people have heard about it. Maybe they haven't. Yeah, we do that every year. So the gathering always honors eight of the biggest and most uh, accomplished. So those are the Dallas Cowboys, Lakers, Marbles, Porsches of the world. And then we always have what we call an emerging uh, cult brand category. And you're either emerging because you're just too new, you know, you're only a few years old, um, or you're emerging because you're very regionalized. And just the world hasn't t- you know, taken hold of that. I, I think of like an In-N-Out burger in, this, in, in the Southern California market or a Burt's Bees lip balm in the Southeast of the U.S., right? These are amazing brands, but they just haven't become globally pervasive uh, yet. Um, so we, we always have our eyes out for those. There's a lot in the fashion space, like Filson uh, comes to mind. Again, they're 100 years old, but if you're not like an extreme hunter-camper fisherman type of person you don't know about that brand there's one in florida called the coast of sunglasses um, and you know they're extreme for sailors and and, and, and ocean you know, deep sea fishermen you can actually kind of see through the water um, they actually just got bought by uh, the group uh, that owns lens crafters of exotic I'm, I'm terrified for them i think sometimes that's the beginning of the end of these cult brands because I don't think the Exotica has the same operating principles that the private equity group did that owned them before that allowed them to do the things that are special. Because usually once you become publicly traded, your, your, your mindset shifts away from creating advocates to creating shareholder value. And um, I don't think most shareholders don't understand that the best way to have long-term value is to create advocates. Um, and uh, so I, I think Wall Street destroys a lot of special cult brands. And it, it's sad to see because uh, it's so short-sighted. You know, um, Chris, who are some of the brands that you'd like to work with now? You mentioned Nike. Who are some of the we ones just, that... Um, you know. We just put a proposal in front of Polaris and uh, we didn't get selected and it broke my heart because um, that recreational vehicle category, first of all, it's exploding right now despite Corona or because of Corona all this quarantining and social distancing, there's you're pretty social distance on a, on a ATV or on a jet ski or on a yeah. snowmobile. Um, but I love that high octane, high energy uh, sort of space. And I think that they're screwing up. I think the Yamahas, Kawasaki's, Can-Ams of the world could take a page from John Deere, frankly, about not just selling machines. You know who else they could take a page from is Red Bull or GoPro, right? I mean, they need to lean into the lifestyle, become champions and celebrate those who excel at it. And they'll do some token things like an annual event or something. But I think that should be their all in strategy is catering to the community of enthusiasts with the same discipline with which they cater to the manufacturing and selling of equipment. Right. And so they could become much more customer centric. And that was sort of our spiel. And I guess they're not ready for that yet. And it is hard. It is cultural. Right. If you grow up in a company, you think about technology, you know, we, we've honored Nintendo and PlayStation. But like, you know, are you are you engineers who make better mousetraps or are you um, advocates for gamers and finding ways to amplify their lifestyles? And uh, the more you think about the products that you sell, one of our cult truisms is people care more about what you stand for than what you sell. But that's a leap of faith that not many marketers and C-suites have the courage to take, but they, they want to talk about their stuff as opposed to talking about their values, their ethos, and their people. You know, uh, from the communal side of things, right, um, you have a lot of agency talent and some management platform for the agency owners out there, you mentioned the proposal. What, what elements that you have found that makes a good proposal when you're presenting to a brand? Well, 
so like is the question what do we advise agencies to do to become more irresistible to brands or are you asking what can brands do to get the best work out of their agency agencies to brands to make them more irresistible yeah again i think that agencies become an agency principles in a in maybe an over stereotyping fashion are wildly insecure people <laughs> um they they cater to well just what is procurement asking me they, they, they take, they become order takers to what the client uh, is asking for. In fact, I just last week, on a, I had a podcast with a, a guy named Frank Palmer in the Canadian marketplace. Frank Palmer is Don Draper. He is, he is a 50 year veteran of the advertising space. He's been part of 20 different uh, ad agencies and every notable campaign seems to have his fingerprints on it. And I asked him over your 50 year career, what do you think that agencies don't do well enough? And he, without hesitating, said they don't push back. They just mm. do what the client asks them to do. Um, and a lot of that comes back to their insecurity. A lot of that comes back to um, what they think is that their craft is I build websites or I shoot TV commercials or I make billboards. I don't tell you your product sucks, even though that oftentimes is the conversation that should be had. Um, and so, you know, in the Domino's pizza example, they said, just go make, make a better, better pizza. pizza. Right. Um, so I do think that agencies need to do a better job asking the questions that the clients should have asked not the questions that the clients did ask. Yeah, I was talking to um, a friend, Joey Gilkey, and he recommended a while ago, The Challenger Sale, which talks about it, and I love that book. It's basically like, you'd think that the best salespeople are the ones that, like you said, maybe just were super nice and order takers, but actually the most successful ones that challenged the beliefs and if they they'd push back, if they didn't agree with the, with the client or the customer. Exactly well, it's what you're kind of like the advice. I've got a I've got a son that I'm thinking that's getting involved in a serious relationship, and I'm I'm thinking to myself, you're not going to know if this is the one until you've had like a horrible fight. <laughs> you know, you have to create some tension and see how you work through that tension to really assess compatibility. And when everybody's in their best behavior, we we consider the agency pitch process like a really bad episode of The Bachelor where the agent, the, the client's the one that has all these roses and the agencies have all lined up in their prettiest dresses, basically saying, I'll do whatever you want. Just pick me, pick me kind of a thing. And sometimes it's the girl who plays hard to get that appears a little bit indifferent that is, uh, that catches the person's eye, right? And so I think that, that those same human dynamics apply to business relationships. Totally, I love it. So in the proposal process and in presenting the proposal, it's, it's not just being an order taker, but it's really challenging maybe some things that maybe you disagree with or, you know, the, the fundamentals of what they're, they're doing now. Yeah, years ago, we got brought in. There's a, there's a large pharmacy in Canada called London Drug. And we got brought in to pitch. It was actually right before we launched Colt. So we were still operating as a more traditional ad agency. It was actually one of the straws that broke the camel's back that made us say, forget this, we're done with this. And we were, we were at, their sales were down, and they were asking us to pitch uh, a better flyer. Their, their weekly flyers was their primary ad expense. And um, in trying to understand, well, do you want us to fix your sales problem or do you want us to fix your flyer? Because I'm not sure that your bad flyer is the reason why your sales are down. Maybe there's something else going on. Said, no, no, just focus on the flyer. And to be honest, what we're really interested in is the, the we, a couple of years ago, we went away from blue to green and it seems to have correlated when our sales started to tank. So we maybe want to look at a different color blue. So just so I'm clear, you're, you've got all these agencies jumping through all these hoops to see who comes back with the prettiest color blue for your flyer with you believing that if we go with that approach, your sales are going to turn around. They go, yeah, essentially, yes. And I was like, we're out. I was like, I think that's so foolish to think that it's the color of the blue is going to make any difference in why people are opting. You don't think it's a competitive problem. You don't think it's a store experience problem. You don't think it's a product assortment problem. Like, it's the blue of the flyer. So, uh, you know, in that case, we, we recused ourselves of that process because the, the client's assumptions were just asking. No, I mean, you bring up a good point as, as far as like, not just the proposal, but if you back up, who's a good client for you is what you're saying. Like you, you don't even want to get into the proposal process if you feel like, 
the values don't match up. Well, a hundred percent. And what's nice is we've been, I think, uh, we've been lucky enough to have worked with enough brands and to have done enough good stuff that when people call, they'll sometimes ask, I'm not sure that we're cult enough. I'm not sure that Mm. we're cult capable enough, but I'm wondering if you would consider making an exception kind of a thing. And it's like, I'm not, I'm not here to critique your category or company and to say if you are or aren't cult worthy enough. And by cult, I don't mean cult the agency. I mean, are you capable of having a cult like following? it comes down to the ambitions and the courage of the leadership team. If you want to become more special, that's half the battle, right? It's the people that settle for good enough. It's the people that say, you know what, if we can grow 4% next year, we're happy. I don't have a lot of time for those people because they're just settling for mediocrity. I want to know the person, and that's why we work with a lot of smaller companies too, is they're a little bit uh, dreamy-eyed. And it's like, they want to change the world. They want to take down the Goliaths. They, they're dreaming really, really big. And it's those, you know, it's the old Steve Jobs ad, just the people that are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones that actually do. Yeah. Those are the best clients for us. Is, uh, you know, I'm not, we're, we're not, we certainly aren't, aren't batting a thousand, but what a fun ride. I remember one of my favorite clients was the local cab company. And they say, hey, listen, Uber's come into our market and our sales are down 30%. We, we can see the end of our existence if these trends continue. And I, I want to fight that. I'm thinking, what a fascinating challenge to, to thwart Uber because Uber was a better mousetrap. And so it was like, what are you prepared to do, cab company, in order to make this fight a fair fight? And they said, there's nothing that's off the table. There's no sacred cows. And they're like, giddy up. Let's go. Right, because you have the right attitude, the right mentality of what's it going to take to become special. I love it. What's what's something they did? Uh, well, one of the biggest things that they did was they have to change the culture of the cab driver. I mean, one of the things that Uber did such a good job about was villainizing the you know what the cab companies were leaning into was licensed and insured versus the Uber driver not somehow creating this faux risk or. It may even be real risk, but it's an acceptable risk that if I get in a drive, you know, an Uber accident, I'm not going to be insured. It wasn't about insurance. It was about customer care. It was about, does this driver give a damn? It was about the quality of if they vacuumed out the back seat. Does the cab stink? Is there, uh, you know, are they conversational? Are they dynamic? Are they engaging, right? So uh, their products are available cars. But what Uber did a better job, and Uber had some other assets in terms of a great app. You know, when you order a cab, you have no idea. It's almost like you inconvenienced the dispatcher when you called them. Yeah, if we can get around to it. Uh, side note, I called the, uh, um, um, we have a, a thing here in Canada for when you get like a flat tire or a dead battery. And the lady says to me, she goes, thanks for calling. Your driver will be there sometime between 6 p.m. and 2 a.m. Like, what, what am I supposed to do with this information? I mean, that's a... <laughs> That's, a, that's an eight-hour window Walk, in the start middle walking of the night. Is, yeah, is, that was the, yeah. the worst customer experience that you could imagine. And Uber made it very clear. says, this is where the driver's at, and here's where he's coming. So anyway, there was a lot of driver training. We also did little things like put bike mm. racks on the back of cabs, put car seats in the back of cabs so that uh, they had different experiences for people with children and people that wanted to bring their bicycles someplace. Yeah. And really thinking about the experience. It's not an ad yeah. campaign. It's making a better product. Yeah, love it. Um, cause let's talk about Communo. What yeah. made you start? What is Communo and what made you start it? Well, so when we, when we stopped being an ad agency and we became a marketing advisory firm called cult, um, we really just wanted to sell the strategy side and get out of the production side. But we felt after a couple of engagements that it was a bit reckless. We had filled our clients heads with big ideas. We'd given them reams of PowerPoint with cool sling of strategies but a strategy is you know, useless until you do something about it. So that really the, the brilliance is in the execution. We just didn't want to be responsible for the execution, mostly because we found that if you, um, you're, you, you're not unbiased. If you have a large web team, you're surprised how many of your solutions involve a new website. If you have a large video team, all of your solutions totally. involve new commercials or new videos. So we didn't want to, we wanted to be more agnostic. So we decided rather than staffing a bunch of specialists, we would outsource to them the same way the Hollywood studio model created a a production company that would ingest scripts and have good directors. 
that they outsource craft services, costume design, location scouting, you know, casting, et cetera. So we just started outsourcing the, the production elements and we just got to dozens and dozens of agencies that we fell in love with. Like you guys are the best at what you do. Do you know Johnny over there? And Johnny, have you met Andrea over there? And they didn't. So there was no ecosystem for them to collaborate. We were kind of in the middle of this. So we replaced us and put in a, basically an app that we say if, if LinkedIn and Tinder had a baby, it would be Communo, where it's this really quick way to source professional talent. And it started for agencies, and then attracted, as you might imagine, hundreds and thousands of uh, freelancers, because they kind of are like sharks in the water. They smell blood. Like, oh, there's work over there. Somebody's they got there's a paying job over there. They all go there. Uh, and then just most recently, we've allowed brands in. So it's a whole new way for brands to source creative talent without either hiring them or bringing on board full-time agencies. So brands can go in and check out the talent you have on community also. Exactly. Brands, you know, want to do corporate videos. Brands want to do email campaigns. They, they may, they don't want to go through the whole RFP process of bringing in a big agency. They just need a really great, you know, photographer, videographer, copywriter, designer. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of an ecosystem for the creative community. I love it. So um, for Communo, where can people check it out? It's uh, Communo.com, yep. right? C-O-M-M-O-N-O-U-N-O. <laughs> I have to look at my shirt. How do I spell it? It's like a commune. So we had a cult already. So we, <laughs> we decided the next book What's is next? Going to do a I'm wondering what's is a, next. Yeah. Is a commune. Yeah, maybe a harem of some sort or uh, we'll figure out the next um, metaphor. You know, Chris, thank you. Um, I want to point people towards a couple places. I have one last question. Um, people can check out cultideas.com and check out the, the great information you have there. There's case studies. There's some of the stuff we talked about, the different principles of a cult. You can go to communo.com. And then I want to tell you, you can go to cultgathering.com. It's the most beautiful picture I've seen in my life uh, in Banff, uh, Canada. And um, so check that out, uh, cultgathering.com. If you look at past speakers, um, and you know, current speakers, you know, ranges from Coca-Cola to ESPN to Skittles to Spotify to Gar the Harlem Globetrotters, a big fan, um, and many, many more. So um, people can check that out as well. Um, last question, you know, Chris, I always like to ask what's been, you know, since Inspired Insider, what's been a low moment that you pushed through and then a proud moment on the flip side? What's been maybe a challenging moment, low moment in one of the businesses that you can talk about? Hmm. Um, well, I think maybe one of the low moments right now is what we're dealing with with the gathering. The gathering, we, we are in our eighth year. It was kind of billed as this conference for people who hate conferences. It's so special. We lock ourselves into this 200-year-old castle in the Canadian wilderness in this place called Banff, Alberta. And uh, it happens in February. And we just finished it. And we, our, our, our MC from the event came from China and she had made a joke about COVID. And we all kind of laughed thinking it was funny. And I don't think people realized that was the last time they were getting on an airplane for who knows how long. Um, so Good we, you thing know, you got it in before. Yeah, it. I think maybe the high moment is I'm so grateful we got it in because it was amazing. The low moment is um, when's it going to happen again? We've already had to cancel the February event for next year. We've pushed it till April. I hope that's sufficient. Maybe we should have pushed it. To, we do have some fallback positions. April 2027. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> well, but there's just, it, we're really going to lose something if it has to go virtual because there's, there's no substitute for the collision and the synergy that happens when a group of smart people who aren't only smart, but maybe they're as humble as they are smart. Yeah. And they sit down and they are eager to learn and to do things differently. And so, I do go to bed at night worrying about um, our ability to execute that event uh, as awesomely as we have in the past. I hope that we do. We're working really hard to make it awesome, but we got to get this COVID thing taken care of. Who's been a fan favorite speaker, Chris, in the past, past years? You know, one of my, um, so my, one of my favorite cult brands of all time is Lego. And I was thrilled to get Lego to come and speak. And they really disappointed me, <laughs> candidly. The speaker was not that great. And there's a little bit of a language barrier. So there's a little bit of an excuse there because they're from the Netherlands. But um, I thought you were going to say I, they're from Canada. No, no yeah, no, no. <laughs> um, the, uh, the one that probably comes to mind most often is Gatorade. 
um, Gatorade, I was unaware of the fact that they nearly went out of business. I was unaware that following their height and, and, and a whole bunch of copycats like Powerade and the like, um, Gatorade lost its soul and Gatorade got greedy and Gatorade went from being a high performance drink for athletes to colored water for thirsty people. And in the trek of doing that, they had short term success. They had three years of unbelievable sales gains which made everybody think that we did the right thing. And then they fell off a cliff, completely unaware of a cancer that was growing with inside their brand and within their organization of losing everything that was special about it. And the speaker was so candid and so honest about the mistakes that they made. Hmm. And then the course correction, the correction was so brilliant where they brought in executives from Nike to say, how have you maintained a, a premier athletic dominance? And, Nike was all about, well, it's what's on you. And, and we, we never compromise on the quality of the materials and the clothing and the shoes. And Gatorade had a light bulb moment that said, you know what's even more powerful than what's on you is what's in you, what's actually fueling the athlete. And we got to get back to that core. And they started going not just to hire MBAs, but hire MBAs who were also collegiate athletes. So they got that athletic mentality back into the brand. And they, they weren't a drink company, they were a performance company. So they got into uh, nutritionals and power bars and powders and gels and all these other things that started to allow to create an entire uh, system that allowed performance athletes to do what they do and they clawed their way back. And uh, so I kind of love that rags to riches, the rags to riches story and, and reminding everybody that you can never take your success for granted. Chris, thank you. Awesome. Everyone check out Camino.com, check out cultgathering.com, cultideas.com, and your book, Fix. Yeah. So it's Thank been a pleasure. Too, Thanks, Chris. You bet. Take care. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side.